Good evening, everybody. Now, I'm just simple, man. And my name is Noah Foster. And welcome to another episode of 205 Live Matters. With me this week, as of course, my fellow 205 Live crew, I call them now, my cohorts, my brothers in cruiserweight wrestling. First off, he's a fan of the man. He is the holiday. He's got knowledge as old as WCW itself. He is Mr. <laughs> Chris Mace. Chris, how are you? Long day at work. Finally got to be all talking about wrestling now. <laughs> yeah, I'm finally back in town from two days at work, but I'll say that story for another day. And with us for the first time ever, and it's been such a long time been waiting for this on 205 Life Matters, he is the founder of AEW Nation. He is a proprietor and believer strictly in cruiserweight wrestling. He has humor beyond Keenan Thompson on Saturday Night Live. He is known as Good Brother. You may call him Chris Willis. How are you, sir? And welcome. Oh, man. Thank you so much, Noah. Finally, finally, I'm finally on 205 Live Matters for the first time. Thank you for having me. Been long overdue, sir. So welcome, everybody, to episode 21. So with that, first, of course, I got to ask the question, as I do with all the new uh, panelists on 205 Live Matters. You knew this was coming. Goodbye to Chris. Why does 205 Live matter to you? 205 Live matters to me. It's just the storytelling of the cruiserweights. Yes, it's going to start off slow. They got to test each other out. But when they start to go, they go to deliver every single time because 205 Live matters. Cruiserweight wrestling matters. Juniors matters. Yes especially since I got done with Best of the Super Juniors, a showcase of some of the best cruiserweight-type wrestling you will see in the world. But that's a whole different video for another day. Maybe I'll do that on my channel, but going off topic. Let's have some fun. So this week's episode marks episode number 132, and we get introduced to the show, of course, first by Rick Maverick, the current drum manager of 205 Live. Get your ass out the freaking 24-7 title picture. What that I grab? Anyway, he introduces us and talks about tonight's matches. Two hard-hitting affairs. First off, it's Akira Tozawa versus the returning Nolan Dar. And then we have who he calls the two heaviest hitters on the roster, Arya Devari versus Oni Lorcan. Akira Tozawa with huge momentum and even being pointed out by the champ himself that he wants to uh, challenge him. But Nolan Dar is saying he's trying to be the best on two continents. Then you got Arya Devari, who still claims states to the Cruiserweight title. But he's out for revenge against Oni Lorcan, who gave him stitch stitches in his ear. Oni says, look, I'm bounced. I'm going to help you with that. So we get right into the show with our announced team of, of course, Vic Joseph, Aiden English, and Nigel McGinnis. Probably the best three-person booth right now in WWE. Keyword three. Anyway, following this, we go straight into our first match. It's Kyrgyzov versus Nolan Dar. Wait a minute. Okay. I was wondering when this was going to happen. My favorite, y'all know, for a better 205 Live, though I don't think he's that anymore, Drew Gulak returning with a brand new look, brand new attitude, and bringing just, in one word to this match, pure intensity. So before I get into this match, good brother Chris, I will start with you. What were your thoughts on Drew Gulak's return and this opening match? Um, when Noam Dora was coming out, I noticed the camera angle was a little bit onto the uh, left side, and I'm like, something's not right here. Something's not right. And Drew Gulak came out of nowhere and attacked Noam Dar, beating him down, attacked his injured knee, because mm. everybody loves to attack Noam Dar's knee. Seeing Drew Gulak with the slick hair, the black boots, the black trunks, He's all serious. Drag Maverick confronted him like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You can't be doing that. But Akira Tozawa was like, yo, I want to fight him. I want to fight him. And sure enough, Dra uh, the general manager, Drake Maverick, went to the announcer and said, hey, make the match. And the announcer announced it, and the match was official. Those guys wrestled a good 13-minute match, and I was impressed from top to bottom. Drew, Drew Gulak getting the victory. That was a big win for him because he really needed this because he was really on a losing streak on 205 Live for the last few months. And he needed that victory because he's making a statement that he wants the WWE Cruiserweight Championship. Right. The most sought-after title, it seems, in WWE with the hardest-working roster, it seems. 
And absolutely, he like I said, new look, raw intensity. There was like no sign. There was like no witty banter. There was no even saving sound feet on the ground. It was much more brawling style than technical. But before I get more into it, Chris Mace, what were your thoughts on Drew Gulak's return in this match? It wasn't really surprising. Like Good Brother Chris said at the beginning, you see the camera angle was different, so you knew something was going on. Then when he tacked Noam Dar, it's like, okay, he's back. All right, he looks different. Looks like something different. All right, this is interesting. Let's see how this plays out. Tazawa wanting to be the man's man, the man's wrestler. He's like, yeah, I want to match with him. He got a match with him. He lost. But like I said, they had a damn sure competitive match. Gulak kind of remind me of watching some of these New Japan Pro Wrestling matches. He seemed like he got that strong style. And I think that matched him perfectly in his new persona he's doing. And he got the win. I liked how he used the Texas Clover League because, like I said, I like Dean Malenko. That was his finisher. That's my favorite cruiserweight of all time, Dean Malenko. So I loved how he used the Texas Clover League. I liked the finish to the match. I like how he won. Now it's going to be an interesting shakeup now with this cruiserweight title picture now since we still don't have a clear cut who's the number one contender for the cruiserweight title right now. And to think there's right now probably at least four people in alleged contention based on victories and recent showing up 205 Live for the title. But again, it's not about what you've done for me lately. It's also what have you put in. But with that, let's talk a little bit about this mm-hmm. match. So it started off with a little bit of a simple exchange, and then we got a vicious chop from Drew Gulak. Drop the curve where you stand. Following that, Akira, he later on down the match, he gets a little momentum with a shiny wizard, senton combination. But then we get a crossbody, faraway slam combination from Drew Gulak. Both men basically filling out each other at this point. Akira trying to figure out this new Drew Gulak, and Drew Gulak really showing what he has learned and what he's bringing differently. And then following this, part of the intense new style of Drew Gulak, we got a few gut wrenches as he's working on the lower back of Akira Tozawa. First gut wrench, he goes to a quick cover. Following this, Akira, later on in the match, he goes for the first lift of Drew Gulak, but the back gives out. He falls out. And we get a snap suplex with a float over. Beautiful, by the way, from Drew Gulak. On this vicious elbow strike. I thought he was going to give him a concussion or something. You saw Akira's eyes roll in the back of his head, it seemed. But then following this, we get a kick and a suicide dive attempt denied. And then he goes for over top rope maneuver, denied. And then we get what I like to simply call just a running cannonball from Akira's eye from the apron over the steel steps, straight into Drew Gulak into the barricade. They call it like a low-angle tumbleweed sense on now to begin this though it's the detail oriented at least it didn't say take down like big joseph anyway later on we finally get that typical akira does move the suicide headbutt dive that drives to gulag over the announce table and then follows up with a missile drop kick and then one of my favorite moves with akira does that fix out jab almost like bob and bank but he doesn't lift up one of his hands in the air finally we get some submission based action with the are not push but gulag being the technical sound wrestler he is at heart he finds a way to reach the ropes and then following this, Drew drops Tozawa face first. And then we go into the Texas Clover Leaf. Strong submission, once again working on lower back with Akira, being, you know, aware he gets the ropes. We get a bit of an exchange going forward, and then we get some more gun wrench suplex into another quick cover. And then Akira, he basically bringing on that pursuit of fighting spirit. He brings up a furry with that spit around kick, slide through into the. Um, High angle suplex, but then Drew Gulak follows him up with a vicious lair that turns him inside out. And then we get a basic leg drop kick from Akira, but nah, nothing special. And then he finally gets a kick on Drew Gulak on the apron that sets him up for his top rope sent on bomb. Still don't know if there's a name for that move yet. But this is where you truly see the evolution of Gulak. Leaves his feet, not to the second rope, top rope, insane superplex. And then Argentine backblanker into a spin out net blanker combination for the win. Drew Gulak finally gets a win with this newfound attitude and aggressive strong style, as you put it, wrestling style. That obviously seems like it puts him back into title contention. So a very brilliant opening bout, I thought, but also questions, where does Akil Dazao stand in this now? Does this shift Tony Nisa's focus? Does this shift Drake Maverick's focus on the Cruiserweight title picture? Where is Drake Maverick's focus right now on the Cruiserweight title picture? As was kind of our other side story the entire night. Once again, 205 Live incorporating not stories just in the matches, but stories within its roster itself towards the championship picture. Yeah, I wonder where else that needs to be. Anyway, following this, we get 
a couple of promos. So I'm going to treat these a little differently because I always appreciate other people's opinions. Okay, I already watched it, already seen it. So let's talk about the Mike Nellis promo. And I'll give this one to you, good brother, Chris. What did you get out of Mike Nellis's promo? And can you describe it? Honestly, he's on a hot streak right now. He's bringing the intensity. He's bringing the passion. He cares about 205 Live, but he wants the best competition. Trust me, if you give him the ball, he's going to take it regardless. And he said he wants to be Cruiserweight champion very, very soon. And I think he is a, a hot top contender for the Cruiserweight championship. He just wants the best competition at his best. And the promo was great. And it was literally just him this time. Maria didn't even interject at all. It was just literally him speaking from the heart, speaking directly to the general manager. Take notice. I'm not complacent. I want the best. I'm here to show you that I am worthy of being Cruiserweight champion. And the fact you haven't already considered me the best after being the Brian Kendrick, a long-time veteran, original veteran of my 205 Live, and you still put me in the picture or gave me a title match? Come on now. That's basically what he was saying. But well put as well. At this point, it surprises me that Mike Nuss has not had a one-on-one -on -one Cruiserweight Championship opportunity. Because I do believe he deserves it. But speaking of the champion, Chris Mace, talk about what happened after this where Tony Nese got interviewed and talked about his stance on the Cruiserweight Championship picture. He pretty much seemed like he was like, he wants his hour. That's what he said he wanted. He said, but he's going to leave it up to uh, the general manager to make a decision. The only thing I didn't like about it, I think at this point, he's, you know, you're the champion. You want this match. You need to make it happen yourself. You just need to go out there and say, look, I'm putting a match out right now. You know, Drake Maverick's on his own 24 seven kick right now. He's trying to get that title because, you know, he needs to be focused on his job. Worry about 205 Live, not that 24 seven title. Go send EC3 to go get that title. Like I said, you had history with him and TNA. Go send him to do your work right now. You worry about 205 Live. When you want 205 Live, worry about that, not 24-7 title. Either make the match or let Tony Nese go out there, get PO, get pissed off because of the fact that he hasn't made a match, he ain't announced it yet, and just make his own match. Go out there and say, look, I'm putting title on here right now. I'm doing it now. I'm doing it against his out. That's what he wants, and do it that way. That's how you do it. Yeah, at this point, he just might as well do an open challenge. He wouldn't mind seeing an open challenge in 205 Live for his Cruiserweight Challenge, seeing who accepts it. Because at this point, Drake Maverick, his focus is not where it should be, on the brand that he's managing, which will lead us to one of our simple stances coming up shortly. But first, next promo, Lucha House Party, they talk about <clears throat> Super Showdown coming from Puncher Reducted. But they also talk about, basically, <laughs> shifting back to 205 Live, the Bollywood, the Singh Brothers, they want to rematch. They're like, okay, after the show that we do in country, reduction, we'll be happy to beat you back to Bale, Bale, Bollywood. So I feel like even though it wasn't announced, we're going to get the Singh Brothers versus Lucha House Party again. And this is where the Lucha House Party shines, tag team wrestling. I just wish they had a deeper tag team roster. But that's just my opinion. So I'm just going to ask real quickly, when this match happens, Good Brother Chris, who you see winning, Lucha House Party or Singh Brothers? I think uh, the same brothers really need this victory. I know it's going to be a stupid, like, 50-50 booking. Just give the Sling brothers the win because they're taking this match more seriously than the Lucha House Party. Like, I know it's fun and games for Lucha House Party to have their fun every single time, but it's really getting old. It's time to get serious. Agree. Oh, Chris Mays, any counterparts to that? I agree. I think Singh Brothers need to win. I think at this point, you know, the Lucha House Party, yes, they're fun and games, but there's times I want that Kalisto of old. I want him to be serious. I want him when he beat Enzo Mori, which I hate to mention that name for the Cruiserweight title. I want him I want him when he was on the main roster. I want that serious Kalisto when he won the U.S. title from Alberto Del Rio. I want that serious Kalisto that actually won a match against Braun Strowman in a dumpster match and ended up surviving. I want that serious Kalisto at times. I don't, you know, it doesn't have to always be fun and games. You're getting your butt whipped by Lars Sullivan. Oh, that's still fun and games. Okay, cool. You okay? I want more seriousness out of him at times, too. I know he's more credible than that, so don't be a come a joke. I know he's a good wrestler. Yes, he's been known at times for Botchamania, but he's improved a lot in recent times. So. Lucha things! Yeah, and to be fair, who has not 
who has not been known for Bacho Mania? I, I, I want someone to try and comment one wrestler from WWE that has not been on Bacho Mania. Good luck. Anyway, so now we get into our main event. Lufa. They were not kidding when they said two of the hardest hitters on the 205 Live roster. Before I get my retrospective on this match, Chris Mace, what were your thoughts and moments from this match? This might not be a favorable opinion. I, w I was okay with this match, but me with the storytelling, okay, Lorcan was just in a fatal four-way tag team title ladder match at NXT. He didn't seem like he was, to me, didn't seem like he was selling too, too seriously. Like, he got the crap beat out of him. They all did in that match. Yep. And me, I know you're not going to magically heal four days, three, two or three days later from this. Like I said, I think he could have done a little bit more selling with the injury part. But, I mean, he's damn good, talented, British strong style wrestler. I said pretty much. He's very aggressive, and that's what I like about him. But just me from a storytelling aspect, I wish he would have done a little bit more selling with, you know, being injured. You know, you just in this amazing match, and you got battered and beaten up with ladders, and you got everybody got their ass whooped in some way and point in that match. You should have done a little bit more selling, but as for other than that, like I said, it was a pretty strong style match that I liked, and that's my only criticism of the match. I think the right person won with Lorcan winning. I'm glad. I mean, it was nice to see that he didn't win with the half and half. He didn't win with his finisher. He actually won with just the. Oh my God! I remember how he. I remember how he won. I can't remember what it's called. The right off the top of my head. Thank you. That's what he won with. I know he didn't win with his finisher, but like I said, it was a nice. To, way to end the match and win and like I said I like the very end of the match after the bell rang and everything when DeBar was looking at him trying to go after him after Lorcan was celebrating and just Lorcan ducks under it he goes over the ropes the bar I was like all right that's a good way to end it I liked it yeah tells me that's not over between these two and I look forward to seeing their next encounter but as far as the selling goes you bring a key observation. You also brought up some stuff that the commentary brought up in regards to what Owen's recently been through. But they also brought up some stuff as far as his time in NXT when it comes to titles. But before I get more into anything else about this and the announcers, good brother Chris, what are your thoughts on this match? I really agree with uh, Country Holiday on this one. Psychology is key. <clears throat> um, the match was really great. 15 minutes. It was worth it. I like when Odie Larkin was working on Davari's arm the right. whole time. And Davari was really selling the arm injury. Like if he wanted to do like a submission hold, like he tried to go for the um, camel million clutch, dollar million dollar dream. He couldn't really uh, lock the submission all the way through. He couldn't because right. um, Nigel McGinnis brought it up. It's like, it's not locked in. He went for a frog splash, went on top. He hit it and he was selling the arm. He's like, oh, I can't do it. I got, I can't do it. And I guess he got a little cocky just holding the arm, and he got caught. One, two, three. Ori Loken wins. Yeah, out of nowhere. I mean, I will say this. You're absolutely right on the selling. If you won with his half and half, it'd be like, okay, this is kind of overkill. You just went through a grueling ladder match, okay? If you're going to pick up a win, you're going to pick it up on either sheer psychology, like you said, or DQ. Like, freaking Ari Dwyer goes out, grabs a chair, and beats the daylights out of you. None of that happened, though. But you're right. This match was literally a story of a one-armed person versus a person that was allegedly in a four-team ladder match, and you figured he would be in worse shape versus the guy that only has stitches in his ear. But it was obviously the opposite case here. Sorry, Tavari, he showed his injuries like a pro, only and he brought the fight, took some grit, but it looked like he still seemed pretty strong in the end. Cause yeah, it started off pretty simple. Look around. Uh, look, there was a lockup. You know, test of strength between Wizlock. Both men basically jockeying for a straight position. There was a turnaround surfboard stretch by Oni. That uh, Ari, I, don't, I always comment Kira sometimes. That guy, Arya countered, and then when Oni goes to counter it with a helicopter spin, I guess, or airplane spin. Excuse me. No, helicopter spin. That's right. Uh, Arya he counters it back and locks it up, and then we get a uppercut crossbody combination. Then we get. Then this is like where this point he starts working on the arm. There's a cross arm breaker submission, and basically then we get some mind games. A callback to what Ari Dvari did with Tony Nese. He's like, "Come out here, come out here and fight me." He goes out there, goes back in the ring, come back in here and fight me. Tries to go for the whole thing. I will say this: not a dumb baby face. At least he was aware that Ari was going to come in, try to attack him as he goes on the bottom rope. He got out of the way. So 
at least he played smart versus the most of the main roster. But anyway, not dumb babyface mentality. I, pre- I respect that. But then following this, we get him basically gains control after hanging Oni Lorcan on the top rope and then dropping him with a neck breaker with a bit of a running start. And then we get, and I thought Pete Dunley did this, make a wish. He wished Bones his freaking fingers out of nowhere. I don't think I've ever seen Oni do that before. And then he starts working more and more on the left arm. Once again, just extenuating that injury. Following this, we get uh, Lariat, though, that turns Oni inside out into a cover. Nothing special. And Arya maintains control for most of the match following this. Again, tries to basically keep a strong grip on the uh, brawler, as you call him, but he can't because of the arm. Then they get to chops and exchange. We get, I don't know what you call it. I just call it a cross arm whip from the top rope to the mat, where only was set on the top rope, grabs his arm, crosses them, just throws him down to the mat. I don't think they even have a name for that move yet that Arya does. Very creative, though. Goes for a cover, still not enough. And then apparently he goes for the splash you call it. They call it the Persian splash first time, misses it, and seems to land on the injured arm, thus extenuating that damage more. Then we get more exchanges, and then the match really picks up when Oni comes in with a brutal running uppercut. And then he finally unleashes this prey, goes to that gritty face. It's like he just goes into a new mold, like Super Saiyan or something. We get suplex release after attacking the corner, after counterattack, then a running blockbuster. And then he goes for his half and half finally. But Arya, he tries to go for his hammerlock. Nope. And then we get Vicious Super Kick, one of Arya Davari staples. And then he goes to the middle row, but you know, he gets caught by the arm. And then finally, like you said, he goes for his miss after taking some chops, but he can't lock it in. He can't put the arm out of the karate army because of the extent of his injury. So, of course, he turns around, gets out of it, but then he goes, finally puts Oni in position and pulls off the Persian Splash, but fails to capitalize on the cover again to injured. And out of nowhere. And it seemed like Oni was aware of this too as he nodded his head if you looked at it and caught him with a crucifix. One, two, three. So I feel like it definitely showed Arya's endurance. Only it just showed how good he is as a wrestler and a brawler. But I feel like this more put over Arya, if anything. Now Drew Big Toe wins and losses kind of matter in two or five ladders, so if Drake Maverick got his head out of his ass and not worried about the 24 7 title, he's probably aware, okay, only one. Okay, Drew Gulak won. Okay, Tony Nese wants Kira Lazara. Okay, Mike Knowles is claiming he wants the best. He wants the best competition. But the side story of the night that the commentary kept putting over, it seems like Drake Maverick's letting other responsibilities separate him from the truth responsibility he should be focused on, and that is the development of the 2 5 Live roster and determining a worthy competitor to put on a classic. Cruiserweight title match. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays more next week, considering Maria didn't speak a word. We didn't hear anything from Drake Maverick after the beginning. And a certain person has been vouching to be a general manager at 205 Live. Maybe we'll finally get a story out of that. But I thought it was a pretty good episode overall. Just two matches. You got a bit of an idea of what's to come. But eh, it was a little over the bump, but not much. I would probably say three and a quarter. Uh, Chris Mays, if you were to rate this week's episode two of Five Live, what would you give it? Uh, me, I would give it three and a half. Now, had we, we switched the matches and we had the main event at the beginning and then we had the return of Drew Gulak at the main event, I would have easily given it a four. The thing that brought it down to me was Lorcan's storytelling. I said what saved it for me is the Bari and how excellent of storyteller he was, how well he sold. I was very impressed with the Bari and how he performed, even in defeat, how he performed. So I'm gonna go three and a half. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna be I'm just gonna say this. If I don't see Aaron Bari next week in a sling or something around his arm, I'm gonna be disappointed. But anyway, good brother Chris, what would you rate this week's episode of two of five live? Out of five. Oh, man. Um, <clears throat> I know this is my first time doing this review with you guys. Um, I took this seriously on both matches. I agree with Holiday. It should have been reversed. Like, Drew Gulak should have been in the main event. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give this a three and a quarter. Okay. So, we're about all even there. So, another decent episode above the mill. And regardless, better than my end of bronze, better than my But, I agree. Mm. All right. Well, let's go ahead and talk about some simple stances where we just talk about anything regarding the cruiserweight division or cruiserweight wrestling. 
And what I like to do is I like to throw it towards you guys to come up with topics, and then I'll choose something in the end. So let's start with you, good brother Chris. If this is your first time. What would you like to talk about today? Well, I want to talk about this since you've been doing this 205 Lives Matters. I want to bring up 2016's Cruiserweight Division on Monday Night Raw. I took an hour of my own time to go back in time to see that Cruiserweight match, that fatal four-way between Cedric Alexander, Rich Swan, Grand Mantelik, and Brian Kendrick. I don't know what town they were in. These guys got 14 minutes if you subtract three due to commercial breaks. Of course. These guys teared it up. The crowd was into it. I just don't get why WWE just don't let these guys go all out. I just don't understand. The crowd, less than five minutes, the crowd was chanting, this is awesome. They was very into it. Looking back during the Cruiserweight Classic, one of, the favor- one of my favorites on the WWE Network, if you have not seen it, go ahead, take the time. Absolutely. I just don't understand Vince McMahon's mindset. When I think when he saw that match, when it debuted, I think he was scared because, oh, oh, it's really getting over. Oh, it's getting over. And because, you know, he loves his Roman Reigns. He's like, oh, I got to put the handcuffs on the Cruiserweight division. And ever since, the Cruiserweights on Monday Night Raw really wasn't the same because they got handcuffed. Now, I went to another, a week later on September 26th, it was a tag team match with uh, Lindsay Dorado and Drew Gulak mm-hmm. against Cedric and Rich Swan. They got five minutes, got eight, eight minutes to subtract the commercial breaks all together. And the guys were good. Like, the, the match was really good. They went all out. That's great. But when later on in the evening, it was TJ Perkins versus to- Tony Nese, one-on-one, no, non-title. Yep. The crowd just did not care. Like, there was opening up, and later on, you hear CM Punk, CM Punk, CM Punk. I'm like, what are you doing? These guys giving out their bodies on the line. And they, the two wrestlers got like eight minutes to track three minutes to do the commercial. It's like, I think maybe Vince McMahon really didn't care, or he was like, oh, my God, this is getting over. Putting the Cruiserweights on Monday Night Raw – was really the big mistake. It should have been on SmackDown in 2016 when SmackDown Live was really popping at the time. Right. On the verge of the brand split. See, this is why WCW got it right. Give those guys 10 minutes, let them do what they need to do, do the little flippy stuff, do the chain wrestling like Dean Malenko used to do back in the day. Yeah. Let these guys go, let them go loose. Let them loose. Don't handcuff the cruiserweight division. Give them the ball, and they will get over on their own. You know what you can also do? Give the cruiserweights a microphone. Let them cut a promo in front of uh, 15,000 people. Give them the opportunity. Let them show they have a little bit of personality, some charisma. Because other people will be like, oh, the, the cruiserweights don't have personality and charisma. Give them a microphone. Give them the chance. You bring up very strong observations there. And going back to what you were just finishing with saying, Raw is a driven split entertainment product. It doesn't focus primarily on wrestling, while cruiserweights are literally wrestlers on wrestling. So if they don't show them as sports entertainers, the crowd's going to be like, what am I watching? This is boring. Where is Roman Reigns? Now, depending on the town, like you said, maybe they were aware of what cruiser wrestling is because a lot of towns, they do have their own independent scene. And usually at an independent show, you see a decent match between two wrestlers. They may not necessarily be called cruiserweights, but it's wrestling with wrestlers. Cruiserweights are wrestlers, not sports entertainers. When you put wrestlers on the sports entertainment show of WWE, you're going to fall to the wayside. If they were on SmackDown Live, which was driven to be the more wrestling-based show back in 2016, I could see these guys all going over and being more memorable and being more demanded and wanted. It shouldn't just be merchandise, and it shouldn't just be who you think is entertaining, why they can't wrestle against a cruiserweight, whether you want to believe it or not, being the people that go over. 
So I completely agree. The flaw is Raw wanted the Cruiserweights as sports entertainers, not as wrestlers. And since they couldn't showcase them as sports entertainers, they locked them down and fell on the wayside. Okay, we don't have a sports entertainer here. Here's a little filler match. Here's a little tag team match that means absolutely nothing. But go out and do what you want to do. If you think you can get the crowd behind you, good. Otherwise, don't care. Here's a paycheck. Thanks for coming. Now, before I... So I think I've pretty much set my stance on that. Bottom line, you're right. Should have been on down Live. Don't treat cruiserweights as sports entertainers. Showcase them as wrestlers, but do it properly. In a proper environment with proper respect and interest. So about as that, as far as I'm concerned. Chris Mays, what is your stance on, basically, cruiserweight wrestling outlook 2016? They, they fucked that up. Like I said, after they had that showcase in the first match on Raw, they, they completely fucked that up. First off, what they shouldn't have done, they should have treated them. Yes, they are 205 superstars. Yes, I understand. You wanted to be different, change the rope colors, make it a different little atmosphere. You could have left it the same. We, we were going to have 205 Live Matters on the network. You could have left everything the same. Let them go out there. Do what WCW did. Learn from the le- learn from WCW. I know they don't like to bring up, oh, WCW did this better, so we don't want to use that because you know we we beat them. But they had good ideas. You got to think the very first Nitro when they debuted, the very first Nitro at the mall. The, what was the very first match? It was a cruiserweight match. It was Brian right. Pillman versus Jushin Thunder Liger. That was the first match of WCW Monday Nitro was a cruiserweight match because they knew they needed to get a hot opener. Jushin Thunder Liger was on fire. Brian Pillman was at the top of his game at the time. They needed a hot open. That's what they got. Here's the thing. You can use the 205 Live Stars on Raw and SmackDown if you do it correctly. Yes, I think they'd be better off on SmackDown. But, however, you can use them correctly on both shows if you use them in the correct spot. You do what WCW did. You could use them at the opening show. You want a hot open? You put a great 205 Live match out there. You put somebody, for example, you could put a Drew Gulak versus Tony Nese out there at the beginning of the match, and you could tell a story. Give them 15, 20 minutes. You could tell a damn good story. You put somebody like the few with Kazawa and Mike Kanellis, like we talked about weeks ago in that uh, nose qualification match they had and how they tore the house down where I said it was a perfect blend of extreme ECW-style match. It was a perfect blend of that combination from Rey Mysterio versus Psychosis and ECW. You can take ideas that people use in the past and use it and make it work on your main roster. It's pretty not that hard to do. You have to give them a few minutes. You can't expect them to go two minutes. You got two minutes, go do something. You can't do that. The commercial break in between, which really is two minutes (laughs) time for us. But see, here's the thing, though, too. You got to think about it too. When you watch Raw, they go to commercial breaks. That's that you don't see anything. When you go to SmackDown, sometimes on SmackDown they put that little clip up there where you can still watch the action while they're doing commercials, which I don't understand that at all. Why don't you do that for Raw too? I don't understand that theory. But you can still do it and go to a commercial break like you need to, and you can still be watching the action. But the point is, you can use these guys to elevate more. If you do stuff like WCW, and here's a problem, too, we had a long time ago. With 205 Live, people, that's why people like Neville, who became, who's Pac now, he left because he couldn't get past being in 205 Live. Once he got sent there, there was no way he could break that ceiling and get out of 205 Live. For a long time, they didn't want these guys out of 205 Live into the main roster once they had when they had their own show. They didn't want them. Once they took them off Raw, they didn't want them being on the main roster for a long time. It was just now when you have Ali, who was performing at a high level before he got injured. I mean, but now they're making those mistakes. Bringing Cedric Alexander, he ain't doing nothing. He's already sent out tweets. I saw that picture you had that uh, about him missing 205 Live. You got uh, Blake Murphy. Uh, no, my God, I'm going to go wrong there. Buddy Murphy. Buddy Murphy, okay? He ain't doing nothing except that one exclusive he did one time on SmackDown. I was on the YouTube. They're making the big mistakes here. WCW did it right with the Cruiserweight division. Learn from those lessons because those guys, 
a lot of those guys like Brian Pillman, Chris Benoit, which I know people hate saying, they say that name. He was part of that cruiserweight division. He went on to bigger and better things as wrestling. Dean Malenko, he was in the cruiserweight division, but he also did win the U.S. title as well. People might forget yep. that. Same thing with Eddie Guerrero. His first single title was the U.S. title, Starcade 96. When he beat DDP, he went to the Cruiserweight division, had great matches with Rey Mysterio, Dean Malenko. He had a stretch of matches where he went great from Halloween Havoc to World War III to Star K-97. He had a series of great matches as a Cruiserweight champion. He had already had a, a mid-card title with a U.S. title before that. You can establish these 205 live stars on the main roster and make them into main eventers. It has happened before. It can happen again if you just book it right. The thing is, you're talking about a sports promoter versus a wrestling fan, and I think that's part of the problem, too. Well said, but, well said. Well, man, said. well said. Well said. Chris, uh, good brother Chris, is there anything you want to add to that? Yes. I, um, yes. Give. Okay. <clears throat> I understand 205 Live does have storylines. Some weeks they will bring it up, and some weeks, or like one week, they'll forget, but they will still remember it. Correct. Don't forget Don't forget about a storyline. I'll always remember every single time. Like, there's been some good storylines on 205 Live. A lot of people will look over this in WCW. This one is one of my favorite storylines. And Holiday, I know this one is your favorite as well. I got you. I can let this out. It was in 1998 when Dean Malenko was feuding with Chris Jericho mm -hmm. for the WCW Cruiserweight title. <laughs> what was the pay-per-view? Uh, holiday. What was the pay-per-view? It was in February. What was the pay-per-view? Thank you. And Dean Malenko lost. Mm -hmm. And Mean Gene Oakland, God bless his soul, interviewed him. It's been four pay-per-views. What are you, you know, what are you going to do? And Dean Malenko said, home. He wanted to go home because he couldn't get back that cruiserweight championship. He felt like he lost his touch. And every sing and after that pay per view, Chris Jericho would just hit home on Dean Malenko, disrespecting Dean Malenko's legacy, disrespecting his family, disrespecting him the whole nine. That whole build up for like almost maybe two to three months. Yep. And that pay per view mm -hmm. when, they, when they had the battle royal, what was the pay per view? Help me out again. Uh, Slavery. God, you're good. Um when a mass wrestler, I think it was uh, Halloween. Cyclops, uh, Halloween. Cy uh, Cyclops or something like that. It, 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 was, it was a mass here, wrestler. I don't know exactly what you're talking about. I can't think of the name. I think, I think it was it, single play. I think it was a, uh, it was a mass wrestler. It was yep. down that wrestler in Juventud Guerrero without the mask. And I think there was some words exchange. And Juventud, I got you, brother. I got you. Who mm -hmm. eliminated himself? Chris Jericho's like, oh, this is an easy competitor. I can go in the ring right now. And when that wrestler took down that mask and it was real as Dean Belenko, you can hear the pop from the crowd. Just like, oh my God, it's Dean Belenko. It's Dean Belenko. And those two had a good match. I think maybe good seven, eight minute match. And Dean Belenko got the belt back for the first time in months, and he got it back. He got his revenge for what Chris Jericho did. That is actually the best storyline in WCW history that people don't even look over. Mm -hmm. well, WCW via Cruiserweight Wrestling much more than what WWE does, than really I think what WWE has done ever, like you all said. So well thought out retrospective. So again, the key thing here is how do you elevate the 205 Live roster? I think it's simple. You first don't put a glass ceiling on it. You allow them to grow and, you know, incorporate themselves in your main roster product. You don't throw them to the wayside just to be like, this person's on that show. You incorporate them somehow. You showcase them. You introduce the audience to what this person brings, not only in the ring, but possibly on the mic. Because, again, this is a sports entertainment company. This isn't a wrestling company. This isn't AEW. Oops, I'm going to get suspended like Sami Zayn. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, but the bottom line, like you said, they need to find a way to put the cruiserweights in a spot where they not only can show the wrestling capability like you do on 205 Live, but show a little bit of individuality from what I can present to you vocally. Because if you can bring yourself vocally and athletically to your audiences over mainstream media, you're going to garner attention. Now, whether one city believes in that or 200 cities believe in that, 
that depends on where you book it because not every city believes in the same thing. So again, they just need to find a way. Vince needs to find a way or fucking retire to bring Cruiserweight Wrestling back to its glory. Okay, don't repeat the same mistakes as, you know, your past competitors, but look at what good they did. You just pointed out the biggest strength of WCW, Cruiserweight Wrestling. But I digress. That was an incredible topic, Chris. Thank you for that so much. Which one are you talking? There's both Chris's here, so which one? (laughs) Well, you introduced this a good brother, Chris, and as far as Chris Mace goes, this guy, he can host his own WCW trivia show for all I care. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> it goes to Chris Holiday on that one. It goes to Chris Holiday. <laughs> yeah, period. Yeah, uh, if, if you and I were going to face each other in a WCW trivia competition, it'll be zero. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about the general manager a bit, Drake Maverick. So the story that seems to be developing here is his focus. He seems to be focused. And truth be told, maybe he actually does hate it. Maybe he's just booked to this. He seems to be focused on one thing and one thing only more than anything else, the 24-7 title. But there's been questions put out, as you know, by Maria and Mike Kanellis, who take 205 Live, as you said, very seriously. They think about it as their home. They think about it as the best. And they want the best for this show. A fan posted this question. I'm sorry I forgot the handle. Have you thought about putting in an application for Jeremiah 205 Live? Maria responds, working on it. So, Chris Mays, I pose this to you. Do you see this as a storyline developing, and could you see Maria Canellas as general manager of 205 Live? Yeah, I could see it because of the fact you could play in the storyline where Drake Maverick, like I said, you would have to play it up, though. You had to keep going with it for a few more weeks. You have to do it, like I suggested earlier, where Tony Nese goes out there and he's – trying to make his own championship match. He's tired of Drake Maverick not making a decision who will face him, and he's ready for a challenge now. He's tired of sitting on the sidelines. And then this is the only time I hate to say this, but then you would have to in some way incorporate Triple H. And the only reason I say this, and don't hate, nobody hates on this, if you dislike it because I said Triple H, you all can whatever. But ah. the reason I say Triple H is because of the fact that we already know from everything we heard backstage that he's been working with the 205 Live show for a while now Correct. so this would be the only time where i could see where he comes out drake maverick's running worried about the 24 7 title he finally comes out there and says look you want to go after that 24 7 title that's fine i'll make you an active wrestler you can go do that i'm relieving you of your duties and then he introduces uh maria canella says new gm that's the only time you need triple h on there to do something like that it was sort of like when, remember when Drake Maverick got introduced back when SmackDown had Daniel Bryan as the general manager, he was the one who introduced everybody to Drake Maverick. So since we really don't have general managers anymore except for 205 Live, NXT, NXT UK, it had to be something like that. And I can deal with Triple H being on 205 Live just to serve that purpose. I don't want to see Vince or Shane or Stephanie on there. Get them, Keep them far away from there. As far as I'm concerned, we're never going to see Vince, Shane, or Stephanie on a Triple H driven product. And since Triple H is driving NXT, NXT UK, and 205 Live, I think you're safe there. But I agree on the whole Triple H stance because, hey, he was a former wrestler. He he won British Boot Camp. He wrestled in TNA Impact. This might be a good way to actually put Drake Maverick on the 205 Live roster and make him be a wrestler. It might bring some character to the roster, too, because he has a character. So with that being said, though, uh, good brother, Chris, what are your thoughts on Maria Canales being 205 Live general manager, and could you see Drake Maverick being an active wrestler on the 205 Live roster? Well, you guys, you, you did forget this was actually a, a good sister, Sydney G, who came up with that idea, so good shout-out to her. Um, I agree, yes. I agree. I think Maria Canales can play the general manager role perfectly. She's great on the microphone. Personality's there. She got the looks. Hey, sex sells. <laughs> so um okay uh uh lost the th- okay i got it i got it okay um i think like madrick would be very upset it will be very upset like he's about to lose his job like well if you want my job you got to fight me for it and mike canellas comes in i fight you for it mike canellas beats madrick uh drake madrick and madrick lose his spot lose he gets fired lose his uh general manager spot he can actually be become a professional wrestler on the 205 Live. You know, we do need character. We he like Madrick. He has the personality. He has the charisma. He is funny to a degree. Mm-hmm. 
I think that would work perfectly. He was a former, what, former X Division champion once or twice. Yeah, correct. So, honestly, that would work perfectly. And I know Maria Kanellis will really be very, very strict. She's going to use a lot of that pull if she becomes general manager. Like, oh, my husband, he's been winning. You get a title shot at SummerSlam <laughs> on the main card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, I like that idea a lot right there with the whole title picture because, again, it could incorporate the Kinesis instances trying to take over 205 Live, which could also become an interesting storyline itself, too. Possibly even up to Survivor Series, we might finally have, like, Battle for Control 205 Live type match. Survivor Series traditional match. Again, promote 205 Live on your main card. Make it bigger than what it already is. It's and put it on the main show. show. Put it on the first match of the card. Not on a filler. Well, just going back to your opening topic for Simple Stances, if 205 Live was the opener on main shows and pay-per-views, it probably would have a lot more say and a lot more interest than just us and, you know, these small thousands of fans of 205 Live, it seems like. At least when you talk to main roster people. <clears throat> but anyway. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I said the word. Eh, he's okay. He's a gamer. Whatever. All right. Uh, before I get into something else on my mind, Chris makes. Is there anything you want to contribute tonight to Simple Stance? Anything on your mind? I got. I got two, and they're both pretty simple. So I believe <laughs> so. So my first one is with everything going on with the 205 division right now. With everything going on with the title picture, you got Canellis. You got Lorne or Only Lorkin about to get their names mixed up, but it's all right. <laughs> you got Tazawa. You got returning Drew Gulak. You got Dabari even in defeat. Look great in defeat. Okay, you got pretty much five contenders right now. Why not take an old concept and turn it into something good again? Okay. Yes, on the main roster, they did it three, four, no, four times. They did that thing called the scramble match. Would you would see maybe at stomping ground, they actually say, okay, you know what? He's Derek Maverick in storyline. He can't make up his mind what he wants to do. Blah, blah. He's worried about a 24-7 title. He just comes with this idea. He goes, okay, you can, have a, you can have that scramble match here. You can defend your title against everybody and do a oh. scramble match for the 205, for a 205 Live Cruiserweight Championship. Because remember, scramble match... You can have 20 minutes. Whoever has a title, whoever got the last pinfall becomes champion. You got those interim champions in the meantime, and whoever gets the last pinfall wins the title. That would be a good way to give exposure. You have all six of these gentlemen showcased on the main on the main card, and you could do something different. Holy cow! You just brought out something that made Mike Adderley seem like a genius. Whoa! Scramble match. That would be insane with cruiserweights, especially. You wouldn't be able to track all that action with enough cameras. That sounds awesome. Uh, I'm not. I mean, I love that concept, and I think Stomping Grounds would be perfect because when I think of pay-per-views, I always think the name should connect with a story connected to the show or a match. Stomping Grounds is literally a testing ground, it could seem, for what the cruiserweights can bring and who could really take Two of Five Live to that next level. Because you got 20 minutes on the clock, allegedly. Six men gunning, going, chasing everything they have, putting everything they have, and not only winning the title, but keeping it. Because it's not like you can run away from the freaking ring. That's brilliant. Uh, good brother Chris, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I got nothing, really. I swear to God. He, he, Holiday won on that. I, oh, man, we, I, I watched the show many times in the past. If you say ladder match, it's going to get boring. But a scramble... Damn, I, I got to agree with Holiday on this one, man. You got to do a scramble. Let yeah. the crew, let the cruiserweights break the fucking handcuffs. Excuse my French. I didn't want to cuss on this first ever. I'm scratching huh. You're fine. <laughs> let these guys go balls to the walls. Give them the opener. Give those guys the opener at a, well, stomping grounds. Is that it? Yeah. That's yeah. Nice More like rematch grounds, if you look at the lineup. Control C. Control V. Aha! But continue. Yes. Give those guys 20 minutes. Let them go balls to the walls. Whoever, when the time limit expires, whoever is the last cruiserweight champion wins. Give the cruiserweights the ball. Yeah. 20 minutes will be like a freaking five minutes if you just watch this and be like, oh my gosh! 
I can only imagine the aerial offense, the technical wrestling, the hard hitting you would see in and out of the ring. And that just sounds insane. That would be the one time I would tweet Mike Adamly thank you, because he's the one that brought that concept into what was once called the Fatal Four Way pay per views that are now dead. But you put the right type of people under that circumstance, that match could be golden and a standard made going forward strictly for the Cruiserweight division. That's brilliant. Considering we haven't had an Ironman match yet for the Cruiserweight, and I feel like that's the next big thing they should do, since they always do these storylines with two, three, four, five matches that end in a huge, climactic, overall brawl, usually under, like, no DQ or street fight or two out of three falls. So if you're not going to do an Ironman match with two people, do a scramble match and really show people what these Cruiserweights are capable of in the main roster. That is brilliant. All right, what's your other thing? I'm very good at that. Okay, so you, we've, all, we've all been seeing how you see different guys from 205 Live Matters going into NXT UK or vice versa, or going into NXT back and forth. Yeah. Okay, we still have these, we still have GMs in all three of these brands. So my question, my thoughts are, okay, so what if we did something different? Like you had, you could, like you had the GM from NXT UK, for example, he could do a trade for like a two month period. He could pick one guy from 205 Live to put on his NXT UK for six months and he sends somebody over there for six months. In that scenario, or even NXT, in that scenario, who would you want to see shifted? Who would you want from 205 Live going to NXT UK and who would you want from NXT UK coming into 205 Live for that period of time to showcase their talents and different air different places exchange program basically okay uh good brother chris i'll start with you you start with that one off i gotta think of that uh wow um uh, jack gallagher goes to uh, nxt uk and bring mark andrews to 205 live okay what are your reasons Wow, oh, man, I'm on the spot. Okay, um, I feel like Jack. I, I, okay, Jack Gallagher is very underrated to me, but I feel like the crowd doesn't really grab to him on 205 Live. But if you put him on UK, he'll fit right at home okay. in that kind of style of wrestling. Mark Andrews to come to 205 Live, he would actually bring some excitement to 205 Live. The crowd would be very into him. I know he's he, he's over when he when he's in uh, NXT UK and 205 Live. Right, I think that'd be a great. Fit. He had a great showing during the uh, Cruiserweight Title Tournament last year in 2018. Mm-hmm. Lasted in the set no the quarterfinals. He lost. Quarterfinals. He lost to was it Drew Gulak I believe. Yes. Yes, mm-hmm. it was. Oh man, great memory. Okay, Phew. Um, he had a great showing. I I put him on 205 Live. Okay. Oh, wow. Well, I'm thinking about, you know, different, because you, you kind of took the obvious when I was thinking of there, because Mark Andrews, yeah, previously on 205 Live, high over the crowd, and Jack Gallagher, he fits NXT UK to a T, and it'd be probably a nice refresher for him, especially since we don't know where he stands right now since he lost to Alberto Carrillo. He's probably still finding himself, as Drew Gulak has. I don't know if he's going to come back the same way, but I digress. When I think of a few people that could come from NXT UK and try to really recreate themselves, reset themselves, one of the first ones I think of is Kenny Williams. He brings a positive personality, it seems, that I think like a younger audience could possibly relate to. He does bring a high-octane style, and I feel like he'd do a few interesting things with, maybe you start him off with, I'm trying to figure the two for that roster, because his tag team right now just, isn't working, and I think his partner, uh, what's that guy's name? Amir Jordan? I think he's injured. Uh, mm-hmm. Another one I thought of was, um, uh, who's the guy that goes whoop, that gets the whoop all the time? Dang. Ashton Smith, I think his name is. But I don't know mm-hmm. if he's on the 205 Live, but he would bring a lot of power and a lot of dynamism to the division. As far as trading from 205 Live to NXT UK, that's the problem, though. They got, like, less than 12 wrestlers, I think. So, if you were to trade, maybe just to elevate your brand to see what they can do against the veterans, I'd probably do the Brian Kendrick and see what he could do against those guys in the UK. He has wrestled in the UK before. Let's see what he brings to the NXT UK. And I would probably start him off in a feud with um, Jordan Devlin, a guy that's trying to put himself over 
saying you can't bet against the ace, why not be the veteran of the game itself? So that's, actually, just, my, that's just my thought. Try, try, actually, try to really actually I agree with you. Them. Actually, I really agree with you on that. Brian Kendrick going to the U.K.? Because he, he's not much of a high flyer like he used to be. He's no. more of a ground. He's more of a ground and pound. He's like what, forty years old? Yeah, but I, and still unorthodox, but still goes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, that's an interesting uh, topic. Good on you. Okay, so so before we wrap up for the night, let's talk about this. So we got the minion around the corner. We know it's being invented by the Rainmaker Kasuchika Okada versus the Goat Chris Jericho. But I want to talk more about his stance on this, this, and this. A guy that he shared the ring with a number of times, a guy that he still believes is a cruiserweight, but wants to prove and showcase himself as a heavyweight. I'm talking about the villain, Marty Skrull. So basically, he puts out this tweet about Marty Skrull being 205, and for those of you that watched all in, he did the same thing during their match. That extended an extra 15 minutes and was probably my favorite match of the night. Second to maybe, uh... Pentagon, Junior vs. Kenny Mega, but, but I'm going on topic. So my, my question to you all is this, because his girlfriend, the virtuoso, Diana Barrazzo, is in NXT, do you see Marty Scroll one day being part of the 205 Live roster? And good brother Chris, I'll start with you. Man, um, I know Marty Scroll can wrestle in the junior heavyweight division, and he can wrestle in the heavyweight division as well. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I have no problem with that. But is the crowd... Sorry about the noise in the background. Um, if, you, if you can hear it. Um, um, he, would be, he would be perfect for that fit. But is the crowd... Excuse me. If, is the crowd going to accept him? You know, he right. does have the whoop whoop, or he can snap a finger. He's good. He's a good wrestler. Hands down, he really is. Right. But... It would be a good fit for him, but I think he'll be better in NXT or the UK. Yeah. I was thinking if he actually does ever sign with WWE, my brand would be NXT UK, and then you really try and see how he messes up with the 205 Live Cruiserweight Division during their little um, twice-a-year um, tour. But I digress. Uh, Chris Mays, what are your thoughts on Marty Scrawl as far as interjecting him in 205 Live or mixing it up with 205 Live Town in general? Well, I'm going to answer the last question first because you forgot about me. When we went to the main event, <laughs> so I'm going to answer the last question first oh, and I'll I answer that one. <laughs> yeah. But the, the talking about the you know trade That's and scary. stuff, you did take Devlin. So what I'm gonna, I would do is I would send a big star. I'd send Drew Gulak to NXT UK for a six oh. month period, and then I would go ahead and bring the Kiwi buzzsaw to 205 Live because mm. after that impressive win, he had the Fatal 4-Way, even though I can't stand the man, and I've never really been that impressed with him, and I've said it many times since NXT Tea Party 27. Yeah. Um, I think he could bring something different to the table at 205 Live, so that's who I would do, trade up. And I think okay. Gulak would be perfect with the NXT UK brand, his style as of right now. Now, Marty Scroll. I- See, that's a tricky one. I'd rather see him in AEW, to be honest. Um, but do I uh, see him signing? Possibility. I mean, would he be good on 205 Live? I know he's been a junior heavyweight. I know he's been a heavyweight. I've known a little bit about the, him. Um, I still think, no, he shouldn't be. If he goes to WWE, he shouldn't be on 205 Live. I think he should be on NXT UK. I think he'd be better fit on that program. Yeah. And the reason I brought that up is because, you know, sometimes I scroll through social media on, like, a Twitter or Facebook. There's, like, two or five live groups there. And sometimes I look at the videos, the highlights. And I don't think the highlights in WWE, they don't do enough justice when they don't tell you the end of the match. But I digress. And someone just brought up, maybe Marty Scroll should be 205. And I'm like, okay. And then I see the Kasuchika Okada tweet. I'm like, really? You're doing that? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I'm going to get some thoughts on that. But, yeah. If I, like I said, if I were to bring in the WWE and mix them up with Cruiserweights, it would only be doing the uh, UK 205 Live inter-promotion uh, tours that happen twice a year. But mm-hmm. overall, I completely agree. Marty Skrull, if you do decide that Villain Enterprises needed a leader, go to AEW. Simple as that. Okay. Well, 
Wait a an hour. So I think that's been the perfect way to wrap up this edition of 205 Live Matters as we got a, another great wrestling show to talk about. So with that, good brother Chris, thank you so much. First time ever for joining me on 205 Matters. I certainly hope this is the last. It was a pleasure, sir. Where can people find you and what would you like to plug? <clears throat> um, follow me on Facebook, Christopher Willis. Follow me on Instagram, Chris J. Willis 86 uh, follow my uh, Facebook group, AEW Nation. We just hit, uh, whew, uh, what was the number? I think 47, 47,000. 47,000. 47, yeah. Today, yeah. So follow that group. You know, we talk about AEW, discuss everything. We don't talk about WWE. Don't post stuff like, oh, can John Cena ever go to AEW? No. Oh, God. Hmm. No, I delete that. I delete that immediately. Noah? Okay. Jesus. Okay, okay. Don't die on me. Yeah, so that's pretty much uh, support support no DQ, support Sydney, support uh Stefan, Jerry, J- uh, you know, the list goes on and on. So that's Yeah, all. there's seventeen of us, so we get you. And of course the no DQ galaxy with your opinions matter too. That's vast in itself. And appreciate all of you. And thank you, goodbye, Chris. Appreciate you too. Well said, sir. And uh Hey, family man, you know the drill. You and I have done this, I think, since almost episode one. Where can people find yeah. you? What would you like to plug? I uh, say so you can follow me on Facebook or Chris Forever Mace. Like I said, just support everybody, all the, all the NX team. We all work our butts off on these shows. We take time out of our days away from our families just to do these shows, just to talk about wrestling because we love wrestling. And on a sidebar, um, good brother Chris, I am so glad you finally got to do 205 Live. And like I said, I, I, if I have my boat right now, you need to be the next member of the NX team. That's what I'm oh. saying. And it's still yes. was that, is all I'm saying. I'd rather and work I my way up. 100%. All right. <laughs> well said, brothers. Well said. And ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who have just found us for the first time, know this. We are the Tool of Five Live crew. We represent no DQ, but more importantly, we represent wrestling. Good old fashioned wrestling. And just a fun chat. But if you want to know more about little old me, know this. I'm just a simple man. And if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm a lifelong fan of wrestling, Hayward Wrestling. So if you want to follow me and talk anything wrestling from the good stuff of WWE, because there is bad, and I do see that, AEW, Ring of Honor, New Japan for Wrestling, Independent Wrestling, support local independent wrestling folks, Impact Wrestling, Stardom, Defined, I can go on and on. You can look me up, nodq.com forward slash Noah, takes to my Twitter page, or follow my simple YouTube channel here, where you'll find preview predictions and retrospectives for stuff outside WWE, and this weekly series called Tool of Five Life Matters at youtube.com forward slash users forward slash Noah Foster 210. As always, support nodq.com. Go buy a shirt, nodq.com forward slash shirts. Follow another social media platforms because your opinions matter. Go make a friend. Go try and make an enemy. Go try and troll virtue. Good luck on that. And as <laughs> always, yeah. I mean, he, he challenges people to do that. So, of course, we're going to encourage it. Maybe someone could finally take him on. We know. need a Noah t-shirt. Here's my money. Here's my money. <laughs> yes. Take it. Two uh, old Aaron guys Rich, if you're watching, They want a shirt for me. I don't know why, but okay. Two but anyway. old Life Matters t-shirt with the logo that I'm wearing. Shut up and take my money. Here you go. Here you already go. Said, I'm already the said his shirt should be. So I'm making it rain, but all right. Anyway. Stay tuned shortly after this. We will be doing predictions. All of us who represent all the team of the will be doing predictions for New Japan Wrestling Dominion. That includes Tetsuya Naito versus the Golden Star, a guy you should remember from Cruiserweight Classic, Kota Ibushi, and of course, Chris Gerald versus Chuzo Khan, a whole lot great more action. But as always, as I like to close, support wrestling else big and small, and let's keep growing this wrestling community together. Simple as that. With that, Thank you all once again for joining us on another edition of 205 Live Matters. Take care, enjoy wrestling, and share a laugh with somebody. Share a conversation with somebody, wrestling or non-wrestling, whatever floats your boat. Find joy, and until next time, everybody, I hope you all have a good night. Have a good one, y'all. And always remember, wrestling matters, especially 205 Live. Bye, everybody. Bye. (laughs)